Good morning. This morning we continue looking at the names that are given or attributed to God. And as we study about God, we can learn so much about our interactions with God, who He is, and then how we respond unto Him. And so we're going to be looking at Jehovah and Kadesh. And that is represented uh, from Leviticus chapter 20 and in verse 8, in Leviticus chapter 20, in verse 8, and it says, And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. And you can see the new King James says, sanctifies you. So we're going to be studying a little bit about what does it mean. And, and other translations use the word holy or set apart, or sanctify. And so if you look up this particular word that is sanctify from the King James, you can see that it's used very frequently in the Old Testament Hebrew, 175 times. And if you look, there are several definitions that are given for the word, and especially in the, the Hebrew language. One word can mean many different things. And from Brown Driver Briggs, if you look at the fourth definition, they attribute this definition to this particular verse. They say, consecrate by purification of God, keeping His people pure and sacred. Now, if you're going to look at a lot of different translations, the way that it is brought into the English language, this particular verse, Young's literal translation says, sanctifying you. So it would be, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord which is sanctifying you or who sets you apart, who sets you apart to be holy. I have chosen you as my people. I have made you my special people. And it is also translated as hallow you, who consecrates you or who makes you holy. Now, if you look at those you can gather many different things from each one of those. And so sometimes when you look at a way that something is brought into the English language, it can have various meanings. And so what we want to look at is the context because that's what has to drive what the meaning is that would undergird, undergird this. And so truly it is God who makes us holy, but someone might look at that and think, well, this is something that's supernatural that takes place. Instead of looking at the direction or instruction that God provides that allows us to stand holy in His side. And so we're going to look at each one of um, the ways in which this will be brought out. But the question we want to ask at the outset as we move to define the word holy or sanctified, the question we want to ask is how does God make you holy? Or how does God sanctify you? Now the word sanctify simply means to set apart for a holy or sacred purpose. And generally that's the definition that is given for sanctify is to be set apart for a purpose. And so let's define holy. There are two basic definitions that are given. One of them is attributed to God's superiority, that He is far above mankind, separate from human beings, from mankind, from the creation. And so the first definition is the general sense of separation from all that is human and earthly. And of course, this definition is provided and given in a book by James D. Bell's which is the, the biblical doctrine of God. And he talks about holy. And this is one definition in which is given. And we can see that because he basically gives a bunch of different verses to bear that out. The fact that the word holy can be used in different ways. Sometimes, and it's really important for us to understand that, sometimes there's a word that is given and then we just chalk it up to one way in which it is used. And we'll try to maybe go over into the New Testament and say this is the way it's used and always used. And it's not always the case that one word is used in the same way. And it is, as it is with the case the word holy, we can see that it has different uses depending on the context. And one of those uses is a description of God being 
divinity, that He's deity, that He is supreme, that He is the Godhead, that He is far above us. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. In Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 10, it says, The Lord hath made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. In this instance, as it talks about the arm of God, and of course, we're talking about, you know, this is figurative language. Uh, God is a spirit, the Bible teaches, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth, John 4, 24. But it's speaking of this appendage representative to a spirit. And so this, again, is that figurative representation of God, but it talks about His holy arm. This is not something that is separate and apart or set apart for a holy and sacred purpose. This is just representative of God who is far above, that is divine, that is great, that is superior, and that is far above us. That His arm is the one that is able to do so. If you see this again in Psalm 98 and verse 1, it says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for He hath done marvelous, marvelous things, his right hand and His holy arm have gotten Him the victory. Again, it is a representation, in essence, of the action of God that is far superior than any other because of who He is, because He is God. He is a part of the Godhead. He is divine. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 3, it says, And I will set my face against that man, speaking of those that sacrifice their children unto a false god, specifically Molech that's mentioned in context, I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given off his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. That, that is, God's name is far above any name. Another instance is found in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2. And here you have Hannah, she's singing, There is none holy as the Lord. There's none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. And so again, this suggests the supreme divinity or deity. It's not talking about God's ethical holiness or that He acts in a right way. It's just talking about the fact that God is so far above us because He is the designer, He is the creator, we are the creation. And so it differentiates between the two. In that way, then He is separate, that He is apart, because He is God and we are not. The second way that this word is used when it talks about holy, is a second definition, and it has reference to holiness of character in the distinct ethical sense that is ascribed to God, and then ultimately we will see that ascribed to individuals, but it has to do with the character, the ethical sense. In Leviticus chapter 11, and you're welcome to turn there with me, our text today will be taken ultimately from Leviticus 20, but we'll be looking at Leviticus several times among other texts that we will notice. Leviticus chapter 11 and in verse 44. If you look at the whole context, he is talking about the things that are clean, those animals that are clean, those animals that are unclean. And he lays down those laws for the individuals, for the children of Israel. And he says in verse 40, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. And so in this particular instance, again, it's a, an individual who is chosen to set themselves apart from others. There will be others that will eat those things that are unclean, but you will not do that. You will be set apart. You will be different and he says to them, then you need to do this yourself. This is a command that's been provided. Here's the instruction that's been provided all throughout Leviticus chapter 11 for the people of God. Here's the instruction that you need to abide by. And if you abide by this, you will be different from all those that are around you. 
you can see how this carries out to talking about individuals today that are sanctified, that are holy. That if God has provided instruction and if we will follow that instruction, we will be separate from the world. He has done so in this text. He says, Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth in the text. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now jump down to verse 47 to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. There is the reason why the instruction has been made. There was to be a distinction. There was to be a difference between one and another. And God provided the instruction for the people. And if they were to adhere to God's instruction, then it would make them holy. In that, they would be separate from the others that were not doing that. That were not practicing adherence to God's instruction, to God's commands. Sometimes when we think of holy, we think of it simply in the idea of having our sins removed and being justified before God. And we just think about salvation. But actually, when you go back and you look at the text, you can see the meaning that drives here is that it, it, it sets us apart from those that are of the world, those that are not following God. And so a Christian, for example is to be different, is to be set apart from the world. Why? We adhere to the instruction that God has provided. And by so doing, then, that absolutely identifies us, sets us apart, makes us different from those that are not doing that. In Leviticus chapter 19, flipping over there to Leviticus 19, And beginning in verse 1, he says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now how are they going to do that? Well, God provided the instruction for them to follow, and if they were to follow it, then it would separate them from others that were not doing so. What did he provide here? Well, for this particular uh, chapter, he provides a lot of instruction, but specifically keeping the Sabbaths that are given in verse 30 to reverence the sanctuary of God. And of course, he mentions that even in verse 3. And that was the instruction that was given unto them in verse 37. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgments to do them. I am the Lord. So not only are the instructions given to us, not only for them, but for us in the New Testament, we receive instruction from God. We have commandments. We have that, that instruction that is there for us. Not only is it for our own good. Not only is it given to us to prevent us from sin. But it's also given to us so that we will not be like all those that are around us. But that we will be set apart as a people that serve God. Men cannot resemble God in His incommutable attributes. We've been talking about God and how amazing He is and, and really the first definition of holy that we've talked about this morning shows God is just far above. Why He is divine. We may have knowledge, but God has all knowledge. We might have power, but God has all power. We might be able to be in one place, but God can be in every place. You start to look at all those attributes and then you can see that God, He is far above. He is great. And so we cannot resemble God in those attributes to the fullest extent. They can reflect His likeness, that is, individuals, only along the lines of those moral qualities of righteousness and love in which true holiness consists. So when we approach God in that way, we were reminded just how small we are and how great God is. If you look at Isaiah chapter 6, you can see the Lord pictured here. Sitting there upon His throne, He's high, He's lifted up. The train fills all the temple. And you've got those seraphims that are there above it. 
each having six wings. Twain, he covered the face. Two, again, he covered the feet. And two, he covered as he did fly. And then in verse 3, And one cried unto another and said, What? You, you, you get this picture of who God is and what it's like to approach unto God. And those that are there, those spiritual beings that are in the presence of God, what are they saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. He posted the door, moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. What would it be like to approach God? Well, this gives us a picture anyway of the greatness of God. The prophet approaches him, Woe unto me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And you see the process whereby there is a cleansing. It's a beautiful picture that is provided here. But in this, you see just how great God is, and it really gives us an image of who God is being great and the picture of what it is to be holy. In Psalm 24 and verse 16, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For He hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in His holy place? How could we even be able to approach? I mean, even come into the presence of God. God is so far above and great. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So you see this amazing picture of what it's like to approach God. So as we begin to, to move forward in our study, looking at the Lord who sanctifies, first and foremost, a person is sanctified by obeying the gospel. If to truly, in order to be a child of God, to truly be set apart for a holy and sacred purpose, to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, a person first has to obey the gospel to truly become holy in this, this sense, to be sanctified but we also see addition to that how it is done and what purpose it provides. Look at Leviticus chapter 20 with me. The book of Leviticus is, a, is an interesting book as it provides instruction to those individuals that are those Jews. As you look at uh, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 46, these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord had made between him and the children of Israel in the Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So mark that down for your Bible studies at a later date when you're trying to distinguish between the fact that we're not under the law of Moses because it was never given to us. Mark that down. Leviticus 26 and verse 46 says that this information here, this instruction, this was given between God and the children of Israel. That's not the only place that that is mentioned in the text or in the book of Leviticus, but it is made very clear in that particular verse. Also, you notice in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 34, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So it is important that as we look at this information, we understand that this was given unto the children of Israel so that then they could ultimately be led to Christ according to Galatians chapter 3, and that was the purpose of it. But as we study this, we, we look at the interaction between the God of heaven and His people. 
and how he issued forth instruction to those people, his interaction with them, and how they were to follow that. And you can learn so much about who God is and how we are to respond to Him as you read through the whole of the Old Testament that leads us to the New Covenant. So when we're in the book of Leviticus, of course, we see a lot about sacrifice. And we know that Jesus Christ has given Himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. But stepping back to the old law prior to that sacrifice on the cross... We see the process whereby they had to continually offer those, those sacrifices. We also see the instruction that is given to them. How that then they are made sanctified or sanctified themselves. How did they do that? It's important to understand, number one, in order for a New Testament Christian to be sanctified, they have to obey the gospel. Number two, they have to do exactly what these people did and sanctify themselves. You're first sanctified by submitting to the Savior. You're secondly sanctified as you submit yourselves. You sanctify yourself through the commands and instructions that are given by God. When you render obedience to Him, it's not just a one-time thing. Of course, in the obeying of the Gospel, you begin the rendering of obedience unto the Savior and you continue to follow that path. And as you do so, as you continue to sanctify yourself, that is, you're surrendering to the commands of God, then you will be separate from the work. Leviticus chapter 20 Man, this is, a, whew, it's a, this is a rough chapter if you read through the chapter. It's sad that it even has to be in the Word of God. And this morning when Bible class, we were reading about a, you know, some pretty wicked and evil things taking place. And we realize in the world that there are people that commit heinous crimes, awful deeds. They do terrible things. And you wonder, how can it be so? Why are they doing that? And why would God even have to provide instruction regarding such awful and evil things? And yet He, he did. Because man has to submit to God to know what is right. Man by himself is not going to come up with what's right or wrong. It's not in man to direct his own steps or to come up with his own path or his own way. In order to know what's right or wrong, we have to go to God. And so God is the one that has provided this instruction. He's laid it out very clearly, even having to outline some very awful, I mean, awful things. Things that may not have ever even entered into your mind, and yet they're here. Because somebody, in their own wicked devising, in their own minds, those that have not ever come to God or never even considered Him or have turned away from Him, this is the path that they will take. And so God provides instruction don't do this. Don't do that. I mean, there's a lot of thou shalt not in the Ten Commandments, isn't there? It's also provided in the law that is here. As crazy as it sounds, these people thought, well, we're going to offer our children as burnt offerings and we're going to sacrifice our own children to a false god. And somehow that's going to be a blessing to them. Now we know that God had provided that, that they should have no idols, they should not worship any other God. We saw that at the beginning of the Decalogue in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And again, you see people doing awful things. The instruction is very specific, it's very clear that if this is the case, here's the punishment. Now never forget that as a part of the law of Moses, you have judicial law. It's not only a, um, the religious law that you would call it, but you have judicial law because this is the government of the people. It was provided by God. This is a theocracy, and we see that here. Whereas today, we have a separate government, and we submit to them, Romans chapter 13. But under this time, God is the one that's providing the instruction. So they have the religious law, they have the sacrifices, but they also have the judicial law. If you do this, here's the punishment. They were to be put to death. The death penalty. Many, many times in this chapter. For atrocious things that people would decide to turn themselves to. If you look at verses 1-5, through five, you've got sac human sacrifice of their children. In verse 6, they're deciding that they're going to go to anybody else but God. Right? Uh, we're going to go to people. You know, you say, people don't do that today. 
You know, wow, that's an interesting word, familiar. Wizards. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Yeah, well, in King James, it's here. But it has to do with those individuals that think they're going to go to some other spirit to get some guidance or some special favor. And do you think, well, people don't do that today. Yeah, they do. You've got people that, that are looking at their horoscope every day on the newspaper. Why is that? You know, they're, they're, they're trying to, to check the stars. What are they looking at? Why are they doing this? Why, why is it that they're going to get their palms read? Why are we got people that are going tarot readings? Go down to New Orleans. You can see all kinds of interesting things down there as you have people on the side of the streets performing the same similar things that, that this is talking about. You have people over... Sees going to witch doctors. They'll obey the gospel, but then you'll find we even had a gospel preacher we had to rebuke. Gospel preacher in Tanzania that was going to the witch doctor. Going to the witch doctor. He wanted special favor because he was broken. He wanted extra money, and so he thought that was how he's going to get it, and so he was going to go over there. He's going to get his lucky rabbit's foot or whatever it was, and he's going to pay money, and he's going to go see the witch doctor in order to be able to... Do you think people do that today? They do. People worship ancestors continuously throughout the day. You see people doing this, even people bowing down and worshiping. They continue to follow these type of things. We've got Wiccans that are living even today. They have to provide special accommodation in, in prisons today for those that claim to be witches and those that worship the devil and all kinds of things. There are people that are doing these things. You think, oh, this is pretty far removed. This is just something that has nothing to do with us, and yet here it is. It's showing that there will be people that go pretty far. Not only will they say, well, I'm not going to believe in God or I'm not going to worship Him. They're going to go so far as to worship the adversary, the devil. But you notice in verse 7, sanctify yourself, therefore. That means that these people had to provide an action that would set them apart. There are people today that say, even in New Testament Christianity, that you can't sanctify yourself. They will say, only God sanctifies, but they don't see both sides of the coin. I can say it that way. It's true that God has to save us. He forgives us of our sins. He redeems us. He adds us to the kingdom. But then God also commands us to sanctify ourselves, and that's why we have the instruction we have in the New Testament. So all they want to focus on is it, it's, it's all God, none of man. And there's nothing that man can do. But that's not what the Bible has always taught. All throughout the ages, patriarchal, mosaic, even in the Christian age, there are two parts of holiness. And some denominations want to focus only on one part, and they want to throw out the other. But I think it is very clear, even in this text, that we can see, he says, sanctify yourselves, therefore... Be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. He's commanding them to separate, to act upon what instruction He has given so that they're not like everyone else. Verse 8, And ye shall keep My statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. How does He do it? How does God sanctify well, he's provided instruction, number one, for, for us today to even obey the gospel so that we might believe. These things are recorded so that we might believe and have life through his name, John chapter 20. That's what's been recorded so that we can know. And he's provided instruction for us as well so that we know if we're walking the light or if we're not. It's so that we can know if we're faithful or not. So that's why it's here, and that's the instruction that's been forgot, provided. God has provided provision. He's provided that instruction. And when we follow it, we will be set apart from an evil and wicked world. Number one, our sins will be forgiven. And number two, because we will be walking in the light. We'll be different. We'll be a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. And so we continue on. Look at verse 24. I'm jumping down because there's a lot. It has to do with adultery and fornication and some really awful things that I'm not going to mention um, that you can take the time to go back and read through as he deals with a lot of uh, wickedness and debauchery and sin and heinous and wicked acts. And then you go to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 24 and you see here, We'll jump back up to 22. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. 
And you shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people. Now tell me, how did he do that? How, how did he do that? How did he separate them? How did he make a difference between them and others? As you can see, he provided that instruction so that the way that they would live, the way that they would move forward, the way that they would walk would be something that would be different. And then you continue on in verse 26. And you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Separate. So does holiness involve our separation from the world? It depends on what you mean by separation. But you notice in John chapter 17, verses 15 and following, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. It doesn't mean we can't, we can't leave here. We're not going to go to Pluto or Mars and say, well, I'm done here. We've got to live here. And there are in, there's individuals that are around us that are not living as they should. They're walking in evil. But he says, but that thou should keep us them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How is it today that we are going to be set apart from the world in which we live? Because if we, if we throw away God's word, we throw away his truth, throw away his guidance and his judgment, we're just going to be like everybody else. And we're just going to follow our own ways and do whatever we want to do. And we'll end up being like those that are described in Leviticus chapter 20. And yet, how are we going to be different? How are we going to be set apart through the truth, the Word of God? As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. We continue to walk in the truth and live the truth. And as we do so, we are then set apart. A person that's walking in the light is not walking in darkness. That means they're on two different paths. Just by its very nature, that means they're set apart. The way in which they're living, the path that they've chosen, the choices that they make, the things they say, the things that they do, it's not going to be the same as everybody else. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 and through uh, 16, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is be brought into you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, not according to your past choices of behavior and your, your sin, your rebellion, your transgression. But notice, he says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of living, of conversation. It's not just your speech, but the way in which you live. Because as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. When we look to our example, we often frequently talk about Jesus being our example. He goes before we follow in His footsteps. Hebrews 7.26 says, For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless or guileless or innocent, undefiled, separate or separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So Jesus has provided that example for us in which we should follow after Him. We live here on this earth. We live around those that are living in sin. And it's not so that we can sit down and join in with the sin. It's not so that we can sit down and condone them and say that everything they're doing is okay. Jesus, even when He ate with sinners, had a message. They were willing to listen and He was willing to speak and He was there to try to save their souls. And so there is a difference in this. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And another paraphrase says, set them apart for holiness by means of the truth. Set them apart for holiness by means of the truth. Your word is truth. 
We are familiar with 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners, or the ASV says evil companionships corrupt good morals. Are we going to be holy? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 and 18 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. So if we're talking about sanctification, we're talking about being set apart, not reflecting the world, but reflecting the image of God in our lives, then we have to follow this principle. We come out from them, though we live here, we live among those that are wicked. We come out from among them. We don't live like them. We don't speak like them. We don't do the things they do. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The ESV says it this way, Therefore go out from their midst, and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Isaiah chapter 55, 6 and 7 shows us how we can have redemption. It's a beautiful passage. And it gives us a picture of coming to God. And here are individuals that needed to come back to God. And there may be somebody here today that needs to come back to God. Or it might be the case that you've never obeyed the gospel. I hope you've been able to see this morning the two sides of the coin that God expects and has provided. He's provided instruction for us to be set apart from the world having our sins forgiven. To be His children. His special people. Set apart for a holy and sacred purpose to serve Him and bring Him glory and honor by obeying the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And then also we see that we continue in holiness continue to be sanctified and set apart as we continue to heed to the instruction that has been provided by God so that we do not look like, live like, speak like the world. But rather we bring glory and honor to God by the way in which we carry ourselves. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. When you see the picture that is provided here in Leviticus, you can see that God is serious about being set apart from wickedness. Make no mistake about it. You read this chapter, you can't help but see God is serious about this thing. He's still serious today. He does not want us to live and follow Satan. He doesn't want us to live in evil and wickedness and sin. He wants us to surrender unto Him and live for Him all the rest of our days. And so we can see the judgment that is placed upon individuals here and we know there is going to be a day of reckoning, a day of judgment in which all must stand before God and give an account of everything they've done in their life, whether it be good or evil. And the question is, are you ready for that day? God has provided abundant mercy and pardon for mankind. Will you then access that? Will you come to God? Will you seek His face, forsake wicked ways that you have been following, return, go to Him, seek His mercy so that you can have abundant pardon? God has provided for you the sacrifice of His Son on the cross so that you might have forgiveness. What are you going to do about that? Are you going to turn your face away from that and walk away? Or are you going to come to God and say, I surrender all? Today, will you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would that, with your lips, confess that He is so? Turn away from sin and repentance and be willing then to be baptized, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, for the remission of your sins so that all your past can be washed away so that you can access the abundant pardon that God has granted you. Or maybe it's the case you are a Christian you haven't been living set apart. And you need to return. 
for abundant pardon. Won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.